I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the news that the West is poised to send nearly 200 battle tanks to Ukraine after German Chancellor Olaf Scholz succumbed to weeks of international pressure. And we speak to our guests Marichka Buchalnikova and Stas Olenchenko, co-founders of Ukraine Explainers. We talk about Ukrainian society, language, and concepts of Russian guilt and responsibility. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 25th of January, day 337. And with me to discuss the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by our senior foreign correspondent, Roland Oliphant, our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, and our guests, Marichka Buchelnikova and Stas Olenchenko. I started by asking Joe to talk us through what may be a key turning point in the war as Germany releases the leopards. Yeah, hi folks. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. And um, so, yeah, it's a kind of monumental kind of moment for Western support in Ukraine. We've kind of overcome a huge hurdle, which has kind of we've been speaking a lot about in the last few weeks, but it's existed for the last few months, really, in the fact that can we give Western battle tanks, main battle tanks to Ukraine? Ukraine have asked for notably the Leopard 2, which is a German made battle tank because purely because logistics are better they're easier to maintain they're just more of them around the world mainly in europe and in these kind of eastern countries but finally after kind of months of hammering at the door uh olaf schultz this morning the german chancellor was well, actually uh, this afternoon went into the bundestag the german parliament and announced that germany would donate 14 leopard 2 tanks to start with and it would also allow are the countries who use and operate leopard tanks to donate from their fleet to Ukraine. So this week, this we think will probably give between kind of 80 to 100 leopard chief battle tanks to Ukraine in the next kind of few months. It's obviously going to be a slight logistical challenge to get these tanks into operation on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, you'd think while Ukrainians are very adaptive, they would still have to learn the ropes on these tanks, how to use them, how to maintain them. So we kind of think the training's probably going to begin within the next few days. If it hasn't already happened, then these kind of things are kept quite secretive for obvious operational reasons. And then Ukraine hopes um, and the West hopes that these kind of battle tanks will be on place in the battlefield uh, in time for any kind of spring counteroffensive that the Ukrainians might might want to launch or to defend against a new Russian offensive that the Ukrainians have been warning against. And so I'll kind of stop there immediately, but we, for now, but what we do is we have basically the UK, Germany, the US have also said that they will send some of their Abrams tanks, but we don't have any kind of timeline on that. We expect that to not be in time for any spring counter-offensives or offensives. And then the likes of Poland have committed to sending them, as have Finland, Norway, Sweden are investigating the idea of doing it the Netherlands are looking into donating at least 18 Leopard 2 tanks. So we've kind of, we're getting to an idea where we might have Ukraine equipped with kind of 100 Western-made battle tanks before any spring offensive or counter-offensive. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Joe. Roland, can I come to you? Our headline, which I quoted at the beginning, includes the phrase hammer blow for Putin in, in, in quote marks, obviously. What do you make of that? How important is this, is this development? And what's the reaction been in Ukraine? Um, the reaction in Ukraine has been quite euphoric, really. You know, the, you, if you, you're on your kind of Ukrainian social media, you'll see lots of people wearing leopard print clothes today. You know, people are people are quite pleased about this. They've been working towards it for a long time. The government's been working towards it for a long time. So, you know, it's a, it is a serious diplomatic breakthrough. You know, a year ago when the war broke out, it's not quite a year ago yet, is it? But um, I remember raising this question with a number of people. Okay, you know, you're sending agitated rockets, whatever. But what about MBTs? What about tanks? You know that this this would this would switch to balance, and you were kind of, you know, just kind of it was kind of poo pooed. Like, what are you talking about? You know, don't talk about the you know, what on earth? You know, do you not understand how how we speak about things in this club kind of thing? You know, it was, it was 
is kind of shooed away, not, not to be discussed. Oh, you don't understand things about logistics and things like that. I mean, the, 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 this is such a shift, such a dramatic shift. And the the sense is, yes, a hammer blow, li- a little footnote on hammer blow. Hammer blow is not the direct translation, the literal translation of what Andre Yermak said. He was talking about a, um, a striking fist. The translation is an art. And we agreed, including my Ukrainian friends agreed that hammer blow, idiom for idiom, is the best way of putting that. I mentioned that just to give listeners a, a little um, a little sense of the kind of anxieties you get when reporting between different languages. But that's the idea, yes, a hammer blow that will change things. The idea that if you get enough of these things, they've got such an edge on the T-series Soviet tanks, the 72s, the 64s, the T-80U, the, the Russians and Ukrainians are, are driving at the moment, that you know the, the impact on the battlefield will be significant and it will be enough to... to change the tide of the war, to defeat any Russian spring offensive, and to allow the Ukrainians to decisively go on the offensive, to decisively break the stalemate and and put in a, a real proper combined arms offensive, which eventually leads to the Russians being evicted from the country. That's the thought. And but but I must say, you know, this is not imminent. So you know, how many of these things are ready now? How many have to be renovated? How soon can they be delivered and put on the battlefield? What you don't want to do is have a few coming in and then you kind of, you know, you use them bit by bit. You want to concentrate them. There's a long way. I was talking to, I was talking to Kirill Mikhailov, who anyone who follows kind of Ukraine stuff on Twitter tweets under the, the handle Mortis Band yesterday in Kiev. And his reaction when this came through, when, when the Americans said, we're going to give, you know, 30, 50 Abrams and all of this, he said, yes, this is, the, the, this could change the course of the war. But, you know, think about it. To put it in British terms, think about think about El Alamein in, in forty two. Okay, it was American Sherman tax that took us from there to Tunisia, and maybe that's what we're going to what's going to start happening now. But it was another two years before Germany was defeated. So yes, potentially a turning point. Don't get carried away thinking the end of the war is is around the corner. Well, thank you very much, Rodan. There's a, f- a few questions here I want to explore. Joe, I think you might be best poised to to talk to this, but. Obviously, in the last few weeks, Germany has come under a lot of criticism for what's perceived as, it, as its slowness in dealing with this question of, of the tanks. You're, you, you, you report on Europe an awful lot. Can you talk us a little bit about how this has happened? And do, I mean, do you think this will, how will this affect Germany's reputation internationally? And, and I wonder, because on the one hand, they've made the decision now, it's seen as the right decision. Will the criticisms fall away? Or, or does this show us that there are cracks in, in, in the Western alliance? What, what do you make of that? Yeah, so the, the the question of Germany releasing tanks and letting other countries release their tanks has done a significant kind of dealt a significant blow to Germany's kind of international rep, uh, reputation. It's not it's not often that you get kind of diplomats from other European member states, some who had almost aligned themselves are quite close to Germany in terms of European thinking, where you openly get kind of criticism and. For instance, just to read one message that I received the other day, and they called Schultz a moral slur on, uh, sorry, a slur on the, the upon the moral government of the world, and that is kind of from a natural Schultz ally when it comes to other member states. So what has happened since the beginning of the war when you when Germany donated five thousand helmets to the Ukrainian armed forces? is there has been this consistent pressure on what is one of Europe's kind of main military powers to do more. And it's always been hesitant to do so, whether it be giving kind of offensive weapons, whether it be then ratcheting up its support. So for instance, Germany at first never considered sending kind of lethal aid as, as it's kind of become to be known. They didn't want to send weapons to Ukraine for fear of kind of escalating the war, um, being seen as kind of an aggressor once again um, after its kind of checkered history because of World War One and World War Two. But it then slowly kind of came on side and ratcheted up its support and it is one of three countries that have donated the multi-launch rocket systems. Like so, we the High Mars are the best known ones. They were what the US donated, but Germany and the UK donated the M two seven zero variety of that. The High Mars kind of baby brother and Germany's always spoken about this kind of fear of what we do we don't want to cause an escalation and turn this into a war between NATO and Russia rather than Ukraine defending its territory against a Russian invasion 
But I think a lot of people in recent weeks have argued for the fact that Germany is slightly deluded in this. Um, ben Wallace didn't go that far, but I was with him in Estonia the other day when he was visiting kind of British tankers who operate there as part of our NATO enhanced forward presence. And he said, Germany has to come to the realisation that tanks are far from escalatory in terms of war. Then Germany have actually sent far more potent weapons, referencing these kind of M270 multi-launch rocket systems. Um, that are going to do far more damage on the battlefield than a single tank or even a what what he what he called creating a critical mass of armor which involves kind of tanks and lighter infantry fighting vehicles. So yes, Germany has taken a pounding for this. Um there were German fears um that it would that it would kind of damage the country's arm in, arms industry, because why why would you suddenly start buying tanks, rockets, for fighter jets or whatever the German defence industry creates in the future if you won't have full control over it. So Germany has always been and will kind of always be that main kind of beating kind of it will always take a bit of a, a bit of a slacking from its kind of European and NATO allies because it is that much more resistant than them to to support Ukraine. But a lot of this is also down to Olaf Scholz's messaging. He just cannot seem to get his message across and explain that Germany is giving a lot of support and actually has gone firm the most. And it's kind of un- unnecessary. So I, I, I kind of instantly, when the news broke last night that Germany were going to send their tanks and allow others to do so, I tweeted Olaf Scholz, not directly, but I kind of posed the question, was it worth it? Talk, p- talking about the fact, is his constant delay and giver worth the kind of battering of his international rep... rep, rep God, sorry, lost my words international um, reputation and the reputation of Germany as uh, kind of Europe's one of Europe's main security guarantors and um, most people would say no but Germany seemed to do it their own way and keep keep going their own way with their support for Ukraine but we can't we can't criticize them for that because they have gone further than a lot of countries and have delivered a lot of aid but they just seem to go about it in this kind of strange way that opens them up for a lot of criticism, and that criticism has kind of put them on the uh, on the uh, on the back foot in terms of taking criticism from their NATO allies. And I will stop there. Thank you very much, Joe. Just to Roland for a couple a couple more questions on this. First of all, have you had much of a sense of what the Russian reaction to to this news has been? And also, you mentioned earlier that. Obviously, it will take weeks and months for the for this equipment and this kit to arrive. Do you think we're in a bit of a Ukraine is in a bit of a race against time now in terms of getting the the tanks in place before the anticipated spring offensive by the Russians? Yeah, I mean, on on, on the first thing, Dmitry Peskov, the um, spokesman for the Kremlin, uh, Vladimir Putin's personal spokesman, has reacted and and he said, "Well, these tanks will burn like all the others; they're just more expensive." So, absolute classic kind of Kremlin, this doesn't bother us kind of thing. On the other hand, you know, we had um, we had a uh, chairman of the um, the Federation council i think talking about how so a house of the russian parliament warning about how if germany supplied um, what he called offensive weapons without say using the word tanks that you know this would be crossing a line it'd be very it would be a catastrophe for europe and the world things like that russia's ambassador in germany has said this is a very dangerous step and things like this you get i I think it's clear the russians didn't want this to happen they did their best to message that this was one of their red lines which should not be crossed and they were very keen to 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 keep the germans kind of worried about that and now that has been crossed um the message is well we don't care you know we're not scared of your tanks so on and so forth but yes i think i think on the whole it's not good news for russia i'd i'd, I'd be somewhat concerned if i was responsible for the russian army in ukraine knowing that the ukrainians eventually are going to have these things coming into the field because i don't think russia's ever actually really faced these things right? these are this is this is an, an interesting kind of strangely esoteric point is that all these western mbts were built to fight cold war battles against t-72s t-64s t-80s or um all, all the stuff that the russians and ukraine's using now they've never really done it i mean they you know there, there was the you know the first gulf war and and the invasion of iraq in 2002 when you're going up against an iraqi army equipped with this stuff but but they've never really gone into combat against you know, a Russian army, you know, properly trained to use these things. So it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens when they when they take to the field. Remind me of your second question, David, sorry. Oh, it was that it, it looks certainly to me, hearing everything you guys are saying, that at the moment we're potentially in a sort of race against time, that we, 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 we anticipate a spring offensive from the Russians. And now we've got uh, heavy armor being supplied, these tanks being supplied to Ukraine. So are we in a bit of a race, race against time for the Ukrainian side? So the race of the against time has been on since before the war began. 
And and one of the things that you know Ukrainian diplomats are always up against is since the beginning of the war they've been tr- struggling to convince their Western partners that that they should supply you know kind of each stage of equipment. So you know th- th- there was air defence and that took a long time. There was um, you know infantry fighting vehicles and that took a long time. Finally they've 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 shifted the dial on main battle tanks, but that's taken months of diplomacy as well. And all the time there is combat going on in the east. It's a bit static now, but you know, especially around, you know, Solidar Bakhmut, but also up in, you know, Kremlin, up in, in up in Luhansk. Really intense combat. Guys are being lost, equipment's being lost, ammunition is being lost, and you need to replenish it. So it's um yes, it's critical. It's about it's about I mean the, the optimistic kind of message that I got from the Ukrainian officials this week last week was that look if you you know if they say yes now we can get these things on the field in a month a month and a half maybe that's true maybe it's not but we're you know we're all expecting at the same time the russians to put together some kind of big push i i think kind of predictions of a another push on kiev another kind of february 24th are not that close to reality i I just don't see the russians having that kind of capability what they could do um is you know pull together their best units use these kind of mobilized inexperienced guys to hold the line elsewhere and and make a big push at some particular point along the line where that will be we don't know it could be across the border and you know Kharkiv coming across from Belgorod back into Sumy it could be it could be a push down from Belarus towards Kiev or it could be you know going straight up from Zaporizhia which would have the advantage of cutting the supply lines between um you know the supply lines supplying Ukrainian forces in Donbass we don't know where it's going to happen but everyone's sure it is going to happen so so the short answer sorry to is is yes absolutely it's a race against time but the race against time is not new it's um it is a constant constant exhausting kind of headache and worry for the Ukrainians which which they've been coping with since the war began Thank you very much for that, Roland. Roland and Joe, are there any other updates you wish to bring us before uh, we go to Stas and Marichka? I think, if I may, just on the battlefield stuff, we are getting signs of things moving a little bit faster. And, and the, the thing is with the battlefield is it'll move very slowly and then it'll move suddenly. And so it's worth just keeping a note of this. And, and the, the thing I would flag is that the Ukrainians of today confirmed they have withdrawn from Solidar. That's about two weeks after the Russians claimed to have captured it. The Ukrainians saying we withdrew in good order to to preserve the lives of our men now is is that a massively significant development you know some people would like to say that it will make the defense of Bakhmut much more difficult others say that it's really not of that great significance but you know we, we've also seen intensification of fighting um down around Vuladar, uh, which is kind of where the line kind of bends um in donbass and starts going uh, east west instead of north south um we, we've had this kind of talk of you know the kind of russian propagandists have been talking about stuff picking up in in the zaporizhia region as well um so we've definitely got signs of of the trouble beginning thank you roland joe barnes anything from you i was going to cover off the solidar stuff for roland yeah is that ukraine has done a far better job than i would have done so i'll leave leave it there and um, i just say i i i i i'd Look at the the kind of the focus on on tanks as we kind of leave it on there um, has obviously been massively significant over the last few weeks months but um, I think that we're going to start looking at how this all comes together to kind of create some sort of combined arms uh, operation for Ukraine can they can they pull it off and fight in a more kind of Western style where you're using kind of deep fire artillery tanks and kind of infantry fighting vehicles to come together and take land back so time's going to tell on that we've we've seen before they're very the ukrainian armed forces are very adaptive in using western kit and actually being able to drive russia out of certain locations but russia has had a lot of time to kind of dig dig in uh build these defensive positions where where it's kind of been threatened in the past so that's that's something we've been looking out for on the battlefield i think in the next uh few weeks as we kind of approach to the uh, time when the uh, ground starts to freeze over and become less bulky, um, but then I'd also I'd also kind of look at we're going to look at it further today on how wh- where does the next uh, kind of tranche of Western support come after tanks and armor? We're going to start seeing longer range uh, missiles, perhaps longer than the um, kind of 50 miles a high miles system can fire are we going to start looking at things that can fire 100 miles 150 miles um are we going to start looking at fighter jets um 
a lot of people that you could analysts at Rusi have looked into that and probably say they won't be as effective as giving some sort of ground kit to Ukraine. Um, but I think the emphasis will be from kind of Western governments. I was with um, Ben Wallace, the UK's defence minister in Estonia the other day, as I mentioned, and he he, he spoke about kind of deep fire still being needing to help Ukraine's military get up to kind of stop being outgunned and outnumbered by Russian artillery. And he's, he's slowly creeping up, but the Russians still kind of have a big kind of firepower advantage when it comes to these kind of deep fire and artillery systems, uh, where it be kind of howitzers that can fire over fire over 20, 25 miles, or um, these kind of precision guided missiles, or non-precision guided missiles that have been used to kind of hit energy infrastructure and civilian targets over the last couple of months. So I, I, we, I think we've got to keep an eye on how that sort of evolves in terms of West, the West support for Ukraine. Thanks very much, Joe and Roland. Well, it's a great uh, privilege to um, welcome our guests today, uh, Marichka Buchelnikova and Stas Olenchenko. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think the first thing to say is, you know, would you introduce yourselves? Tell us a little bit about uh, yourselves and your lives in Ukraine. Um, and um, we've been talking about uh, the German announcement on tanks. So it'd be great if you'd like to give us just some of your reaction to that. I mean, we, we asked Roland what he thought, that, what, what his sense of the reaction in Ukraine. But it'd be great to hear uh, your, your thoughts on that as well. So I don't know who would like to go first. Uh, I can go first. Hello, everyone. And thank you, David, for the introduction and that you're having us today. It's really nice. And I also I wanted to say thank you to Roland and Joe about such kind of really deep analytics about what's going on in Ukraine. Thank you that you're doing this. It's really important for us. And what about the tanks? Of course, my first reaction was like, okay, finally, it's really cool that they're doing it. But another reaction was like, okay, we wait some time that we can use actually for learning how to use these tanks you know, and to use them already. But we will wait. Of course, we have to wait. And what about myself? My name is Maria Bucernikova or Marichka, call me this. I'm a project manager of uh, Ukraine War Archive. It's the project of NGO DocuDays and Infoscope. And also I'm a co-founder of Ukraine Explainer, our small media project about what's going on in Ukraine, uh, about social, cultural, political and other relationships between us and Russia and other post-Soviet countries. Thank you very much, uh, Marichka. Stas. Yeah, no. hi, hi, everyone. Hi, David. Thank you for having us. I'm Stas Olenchenko. I'm also a co-founder of uh, Ukraine Explainers. Uh, I'm also a UX writer at Macpo. I write for, for digital products. And uh, so partly b- because I'm, I'm the writing guy, Marichka has also worked in the media. So when the full-scale invasion began, we realized we wanted to be helpful somehow. And uh, we started the Ukraine Explainers to, I think, to cover the gap in understanding of the news coming from Ukraine and, and the way Ukraine has been covered by, by any media outlets. So yeah, we, we, I think with this, with this project, we tried to, to cover this gap in, in uh, covering and understanding. And, and about the tanks, I agree with Marichka. I think Roland and Joe already gave a pretty, pretty clear like idea of how Ukrainians feel about it. The overall emotion, of course, it's, it's, it's joy. We are, we are grateful. We're pleased with this news. So finally, it happened. But I think Ukrainians uh, over the last year learned to manage our expectations in a way that if something is announced, like there's still a lot of work to be done to have these things actually Im- implemented and have impacts on on the battleground so so we're, we're still kind of like waiting for the next steps but it's 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 a it's a great ba- breakthrough that's for sure well, thanks stas and marichka well just before we talk about your ukraine explainers project would you tell us a little bit about your life in the past in the past year what what has been the impact of the full-scale invasion on on you and your lives how has it changed what what you do and if you're comfortable talking about that those of your friends and family as well as all ukrainians this past year has been wild. We actually went for a vacation right before the invasion. So we were like locked out of Ukraine when everything happened. Uh, we still remain in the EU. Most of our friends are in Kiev. Uh, our families are in Kiev. Uh, I mean, there were stories of like evacuation, of uncertainty, what, what to do next. And well, right now it's like this, like most of our friends and family are in Kiev. They are they have learned to to manage life in in these circumstances and everybody's fine and healthy so 
that's that's a good thing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I can talk a lot about like the experience of, of being Ukrainian this past year, but I don't sure we have the time for this kind of conversation. If you're able to, how, I mean, how would you how would you sum it up for for our listeners? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, for us personally, like I, I I haven't been in Ukraine like during during the war during the invasion, so I, I really don't feel like I am like that that my experience is uh, is the, is the kind of experience that I would like to spotlight. I think people who are actually like evacuating from the cities or experiencing bombings stuff like that. Those are the people that 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 have a lot more to tell. I think. Well, Stas, why didn't you tell us a little bit about Ukraine Explainers, how it started, and what you attempt to achieve with this project? So, uh, as I said, when the invasion began, we just wanted to to be helpful. I think there was this uh, widespread idea in Ukraine that uh, when the war began, like everybody was trying to be helpful in their ways and and to to do something that they're good at to to help everybody. So, so that was our first, like, the first idea was to to do something on the like in the, in the informational support because we saw that there was a lot of still myths about Ukraine. There was a lot of misunderstanding of what this invasion was and what it wasn't. And and we decided that we would do these like short explainers that are easily shareable in social media that would cover you know. Uh, kind of important things that that we felt they're not really uh, properly covered by by many foreign media. So for instance, like it it was clear for us and for most Ukrainians that uh, Russian invasion was a neo-colonial invasion, that the aim was to to conquer Ukraine, to submit Ukraine, and that it was part of this uh, larger Russian imperial project. And and like a lot of news that that came in should have should have been viewed from this perspective. And and unfortunately, we saw that they weren't initially covered like that. There was a lot of confusion about the aims of Russia. Where would it stop? What what's what 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 is what is it trying to achieve? And so, yeah, that that's that's w- when we when we started doing it. And since then, we've we've done a lot of uh, explainers from history to language to modern politics to uh, uh, spotlight spotlighting a little bit uh, the topic of Russian imperialism and how it all comes together in in this uh, this war. Well, thank you, Stas. Marichka, uh, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, actually, I guess that I have nothing to add. Just, uh, you know, it was a small initi- initiative for us, just trying to help and to be like fighters in this informational war. But right now, I think that we are really proud that we actually managed to do something like this with really small amount of resources. There is only two of us, but we managed to keep keep going, continue this project uh, while we're having full-time jobs. And also this project actually helped us to find more really great prominent Ukrainian voices to meet them and to cooperate somehow. It's also really important to understand that you're not alone. To, to see this feedback from other people, from your audience, it's really helpful and really supporting. So, yeah, it's so, something really interesting that's actually happening uh, with all these events. Well, it'd be really great to hear a little bit. I know we don't have all the time in the world, sadly, but uh, you've written about, you both have written about all sorts of different subjects, Stas, as, as you've explained. Stas, one of the things you mentioned was Ukrainian language, and there's a, a long a carousel detailing some of the, detailing the information you would like foreigners to understand about the development and of the Ukrainian language over, over the, the last couple of hundred years. Would you take us through that? What, what, did, what did you want people not from Ukraine to understand? Yeah, so I think if there's one topic that that uh, if, if you can learn one topic about Ukraine to understand everything that's been happening in the last year, I think language is is the key. Specifically, like the relationships of Ukrainian and Russian language uh, languages in Ukraine. So yeah, but like we did a, a couple of materials on that. I also wrote a thread about my own like journey from from being a bilingual person from Kiev who is. I was primarily speaking Russian, but I cons- always considered myself ethni- ethnically Ukrainian. To right now speaking uh, mostly Ukrainian, almost like entirely, and and how it all like plays in into this larger process of probably I, I would call it decolonization of, of many many Ukrainian minds as well. 
And and uh, like about the explainer, well, we basically gave some context of uh, first of all that Ukrainian and Russian are different languages, and there are pretty like they're more different than most people realize. That's kind of the basics. But again, we saw that like these basic truths need to be repeated. Uh, also a little bit about history of of Ukrainian language in Ukraine, and also how the the large part of Russian speaking people in Ukraine are not there because because they're ethnic Russians or anything like that. That it's not that they were locked out of Russia because of some political instability. It's it's because of a deliberate Russian politics of Russification that happened throughout the nineteenth century, that happened throughout the Soviet period. And so there there was a system behind turning many people in Ukraine into Russian speakers. And the modern bilingualism in Ukraine is much more complicated than just like ethnic markers or political markers that, that is that are often like prescribed to it when talking about it in you know popular media. I think. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stas. I'm sure Roland and Joe will have some thoughts and questions on that. But before that, Mar- uh, Marichka, from the explainers that you've written, what what is one that you'd like to sort of pull out and talk a little bit about for us? One that you think is particularly important for for, uh, for, for listeners and for the audience? Yeah, thank you. For me, we have this explainer why we think all Russians are responsible for the war. And it's not one of my favorite, but it's really important, I guess, especially for future relationships with Ukraine and Russia after the war. Because a lot of people actually mixed up responsibility and guilty. And uh, when we're talking that Russian society actually is responsible for this war and for all previous war, like Georgia and even Moldova, they mix it up with guilty and saying like, okay, so every person, every child is guilty for that. How should they be responsible for this? What should they do? Do they all, all of them should go to the jail? And the simple, the simple answer for this is it's not about guilty, it's about responsibility and about justice. So Ukrainians want not revenge, Ukrainians want justice. And this explainer actually about the concept of collective, collective responsibility, which I think it's really important for the society that wants to, to be a democratic developed society, not authoritarian, not a dictator society. So I guess that Russians should face all this, their imperialistic, imperial views and mistakes and wars and tragedies that they're committed and admit it, work it through, uh, you know, to develop health society, Western society, European society. And actually, I, I, I know that it's really a discussable topic. I know that we can talk about it like a lot of hours and I know that there are a lot of different views, but to my mind, it's very important, you know, to deal with the war and to avoid, prevent future tragedies and genocide. Because otherwise, as we can see, for example, I don't know, the example of Balkan wars, they, they still uh, cannot admit war crimes that they committed. And they still have some, you know, points about the escalation. So I, I, I guess that it's really important to, to have a discussion about collective responsibility and to admit that, okay, it's not about guilty, it's about justice. And if we want to, to, to have some good future for us, we should admit that we are responsible. And it's really interesting for me that when I talk to Russians and when I see some articles or even a post on social media, a lot, of, a lot of them don't understand that they have si- si- kind of subjectivity or agency. They don't feel uh, responsible for the society that they they're live in. But if they want to live happy in Russia, in their own country, in their hometown, they actually should admit their uh, previous mistakes and learn from their past. So this is why I actually believe that it's really important topic and we should maybe talk about it more and have open discussion about it. I think it's. I would also like to add a little bit that if if we want this war to end with justice, not just with a ceasefire, then we have to like talk about these complicated topics already about about you know cultural connectivity, historical legacy, all that kind of stuff. Of course, right now the the most important part is is helping Ukraine win, helping Ukraine actually push Russians out of its territory. But we have to keep in mind all these broader topics regarding society, politics, culture. 
Well, thank you, Stas and Marichka, for talking us through this, some some of the things you've been working on. I've got more questions, and, and you're completely right. We could talk about this for four hours. Just very quickly, Roland or Joe, no worries if not at all, but I just wondered if you had any questions for, for Stas and Marichka on some of the things we've been talking about. I think my thoughts on this are too unformed. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say something that is not necessarily fully what I think. I mean, I hear what they say. I think so. I've, I've got the, I've got the, the explain away from the front of you. I've just been reading through it, and I part of it I think is spot on. I mean, I think, I think it's absolutely spot on that that what when it comes down to it, it's kind of Russian imperialism in the sense of just the way Russia and Russians look at themselves in general has a lot to do with how this war went and, and, and how it happened. And in this point about how Russia has never really kind of confronted what it means to be an empire and how people who are colonized feel about that. And as a Brit who's lived in Russia, I mean, it is, it is such a contrast between the kind of, you know, the agonizing debates we've had in Britain about the legacy of, the, of, 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 of our own empire, which have been going on for decades and continues to go on today, and and how generally, you know, it's not it's not complete, it's not a black and white picture, but but generally that kind of reflection hasn't gained traction in in Russian society, and I do think there is a case for saying that has to be addressed if 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 this kind of war isn't happening again, that does have to be addressed. I must say I find the distinction between guilt and responsibility, I find this somewhat nuanced and I kind of understand why people might say, you say responsibility, you're meaning guilt to me. I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll have to think about it a bit more. I, I, it, it does seem to me a little bit of a semantic distinction to say, oh no, no, I'm not saying you're Ill guilty, but you are all responsible. Um, I haven't made up my mind about that, but, but I, I definitely think it's worth reading this explainer um, if anybody hasn't. Thank you, Roland. Uh, Marich Christas, what, what do you, out of interest, what, what do you make of that? Do you find explaining that distinction or thinking about that, that distinction tr- tricky to do? And h- how do you make that distinction? Well, yeah, absolutely. Roland, thank you for, for your comment. I, like, you're, you're completely right. It, it is a very tricky distinction. And I think it, it's, it's a topic worth exploring further in a way that we, sh- we should also talk about it case by case, of course. Uh, for instance, if, if there's like, if there's a person in Russia who keeps paying taxes right now, uh, well, m- most Russians do, of course, and and these uh, like taxpayer money go to to actually, you know, conduct genocide against Ukraine. Like, do they share responsibility? And our stance here is yes, of course. And like part of of being aware of of all the crimes that are happening right now in Ukraine and also the crimes of of the past that Russia has committed. Like you have to first realize that there is kind of connectivity and that your personal input can be related to to these crimes that are happening there. You're you don't exist in a vacuum as a person in a society in a state, and and I think that like the that is that is one of the focuses of this discussion for us. Well, for me personally, like guilt is something that that is more deliberate, that is more focused on individual. And responsibility is more about the broader consequences of your actions, of your life choices. I totally agree because you cannot go for further if you cannot work out all the mistakes that were done previously. I think that it's also work on personal level, but it also can work on social level as as a society. If you if you want to be a citizen of your country and you want to build something in this country, how we can be so ignorant about what your government actually is doing or was doing. Yeah, I see it. I, I, I see that. Um, I mean, I suppose one, one of the things that strikes me, I mean, amongst the Russians that I know, um, those who, I mean, the ones who express a sense of guilt are really the ones who I kind of feel like have the least kind of real responsibility. The kind of people who say, you know, I wake up every morning and I, and I, I feel guilty about what my country is doing and it's horrible. Um, are, you know, conversely, the kind of people who, who, you know, my, 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 in your sense, bear responsibility because they're, you know, Russian citizens and, and therefore, you know, part of the state, but they're really the kind of people who, who have not been at all involved in, in this machinery of war or have kind of made their, tried their best not to give succor to, to, to Putin's regime and things like that. I suppose that's a conundrum. And the other thing I was just wondering what you'd make of the thought that, I mean, maybe one of the issues is if you're going to say, you know, Russians have to take responsibility for their society and what their society does and what their government does. 
this this sense that actually in Russia, for a lot of Russians, like you don't have ownership of your own society. Like that's that's the assumption, and that there's a kind of an absolutely enormous kind of gap in perception there that 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 contributes to to what's happened. And I, I do kind of feel like that is the one of the big distinctions between kind of Ukraine and Russia is is kind of an, an active sense in Ukraine that you know this is our society we're going to build it we, you know we're going to have a you know all kinds of struggles and chaos and so on but it, it's our bloody country and you know we're going to do it whereas in Russia it's kind of I don't know like like that sense has been so thoroughly extinguished um, do you think there would be a an uphill struggle to kind of restore that as as, as part of this this post war kind of responsibility and reckoning that you think has to happen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, if if Russia is like striving to to become a democracy, this is absolutely essential because I mean, I think Putin has become what he is in in great part because there was this lack of of agency and and even of like understanding of ordinary people's role in their country's politics. Th that is how dictators be become dictators that is how yeah that, that that is partly why wars that violent can happen still to this day because well people don't believe that in their agency and that they can actually like change something and and also that they are in in any way responsible for the actions of their governments that that as well so i, I think it, it has to change if russia is to become a different kind of decolonized version of itself democratized yeah marich would you like to add to that or, or roland mm, i understand that this topic is really difficult if we're talking about it not in theory but on practice because i also got a lot of questions from russians too that's like okay we can admit that we should do something and we are responsible but how you can tell the whole society that was so brainwashed and didn't have actually agency for like hundreds of years, how you can do something like that to, to explain them. And I don't have answer for this question. I know that it's like a very big future discussion. I guess it's really important, but uh, the, only, the only way for me, it's just only education and that's it what you can do. But, you know, I, I, I usually refer to experience of Germany, post-war Germany, and I know that actually the generation that lived in this period of time of the World War II, they, a lot of them, by some different polls and research, they didn't admit the, the, the whole responsibility for, for all these crimes and genocide and all the horrible things. But next generation did. And I guess that a lot of Germans who are young and they don't even have like pa parents or even grandparents who were on the lived in this period of time but they still feel such kind of responsibility but they're already like spent a lot of uh, a lot of time you know now so i guess it's just a long process but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it right now i guess this is important to as Estas already said that it's important to have this conversation and discussion now just to help future generations maybe and uh, you know to realize that they, they also should think about it not just to forgive forget and that's it but to my mind like we should work out it as 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 democratic society and they should do it as well can i also add that it like for me the the discussion about responsibility is also it, it's directly connected to this discourse of the, the idea that this all is putin's war that uh, it's all just like Russian elites and, and, and Russian society like has nothing to do with it. And this, this discourse, I think, was very persistent, especially in the first months of war, when there were at least some hopes that, that there's going to be some kind of revolt, there's going to be some kind of you know, instability in Russia because people do not support this war. And, and the, the longer war goes, the more we see that that's not really the case. And that whatever is has caused this war is uh it is something deeper than just you know evil di di dictator and evil elites and and like the most probably 
it is directly related to this to Russian imperialism and also to failure to take responsibility for their state, their history, and and their past. So I guess that is also why this entire idea is important right now. Brilliant. Thank you, Stas. Thank you, Marichka. Just one more question. I know we don't really have enough time to cover it, so maybe in the future we could come back to it. But Marichka, you mentioned you're working on the Ukraine war archive. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and what you hope to achieve? Yeah, sure. I'll try to do it quick. Ukraine war archive actually is a big database of all the video, audio, photo materials about the war in Ukraine since full scale and it works as a catalog or archive. We're collecting on their material from partners such as media, human rights organizations, different initiatives, and we're also collecting from just people who can send us their materials from smartphone through Telegram bot. We're doing it actually to preserve, to systematize all these materials for future uh, research for international criminal courts and also for criminal justice for all the war crimes because we're also collecting piece of evidence or just interviews with witnesses of war crimes who can tell their story they share this experience and we can use this them later Uh, so yeah it's really huge and ambitious project we launched it in march i guess and if you have any ideas or maybe some you want to partnership or maybe ask about our experience how we're doing it you can write me on Twitter and we can build a conversation later because for me it's really interesting and you know the exclusive thing about this war that we can watch it online and actually it gives us more information what's going on and it also gives us more opportunities for justice and gives us more opportunity to research to 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 tell this story of this invasion for future, I guess it can be very prominent and important for all those people who reflect on what's going on right now. So yeah, it's just in a few words. <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much, Marichka. One final, final question from me. A lot of your work, as you've explained and talked about this afternoon, is about trying to present a different sort of Ukraine to the world, try and show foreigners where you think they've gone wrong and understanding your language, culture, politics and, and, and everything else. Just turning the question around, I'm curious to ask, has your understanding and view of, of neighbouring countries and cultures changed at all over the, over the past year? And, and if so, how so? Sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that it definitely has changed. I mean, one of, one of the aspects is that I think as many other Ukrainians, we feel even more connected to to the broader European history right now. I think before the full-scale invasion, there was this feeling that Ukraine is Europe, but it's not entirely Europe in a way that it is not part of the EU. And, and there are still some some kind of limitations and, and, and things that, that put us apart. And right now, I think this distinction, well, I, I wouldn't say it disappeared, but it definitely became much weaker. And we're seeing a lot more diversity within Ukraine. And I think a lot of people from from the EU and from other European countries also see a lot of diversity within Ukraine as well. So so I think there was this kind of mutual exploration going on this, this entire year. I would also say that I have felt a lot more solidarity with other nations, other countries that have experienced Russian colonialism as well. The Baltics, the Poland, Georgia, Central Asian countries. Uh, I think we are seeing like this huge the emergence of this discussion of uh, our commonalities and 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 our shared experiences in in the broader historical sense, and and that has been very very helpful, uh, both like emotionally and you know in in, in terms of like searching for inspiration searching for for similarities and for, I don't know, exploring history, exploring different aspects of of the current war. Thank you, Staka. What what about you? And then we'll move to our final thoughts. But Marietje Puchelnikova. Yeah, I have very similar feelings uh, about our culture and our identity. I also rediscovered my identity as Ukrainian. Finally, I'm really proud proud to be Ukrainian, but it it wasn't like that for for the whole of my life. And also, I can see the same things with other countries, our neighboring countries that were also occupied by USSR. And it's really great thing to see the diversity and see 
how people from this country actually also rediscovered their uh, history. It's really cool to see. Like, for example, I just recently knew that Georgia, like their name, the, the way how they call themselves, sexually Sakratvelo, but Russians named this country Hruzia. And Hruzia is not like really nice word for them, but Sakratvelo or Georgia, it's the real name of this country. And, you know, it's like something really new for me, but I, I understand that it was for them like a fact for many, many years. And, you know, it's really, it's really great to see how we can learn something new about facts, history and stories that we thought that we knew like perfectly. So I guess it's also, of course, the war is, is, is very horrible and I ca don't want to compare like with anything, but I can see that it's actually quite helped us to realize who we are. And I guess that it's a really good, a good example for other countries and other cultures, because you shouldn't be ashamed of who you are. It's not like that. I, I want to quickly add that it's, it's as much about learning as it is about unlearning some stuff, because again, this war uncovered a lot of misconceptions and myths about Eastern Europe and, and like, this is the time to, to finally tackle these, uh, uh, yeah, these myths, basically. Well, thank you so much, Stas and Marijka, for your time today. It's hugely appreciated. It's been absolutely fascinating and powerful and moving to, to hear from you and to talk to you about what you've been working on and 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 everything you've you've been doing. So, thank you so much for your time. Very sorry we've run over slightly, but to end today's broadcast, we'd like to just go around the table, this virtual table, and ask you for your your final thoughts. And for Stas, Stas and Marijka, really, you know, let us know a little bit about what you'll be looking at in the next few weeks. What you'd like our listeners to go away and, and look up and think. About about and, and and please please tell us and all of us how we can follow you and and your work but bef before before we go to our guests roland oliphant thank you so much for all of your time today what are your final thoughts oh i don't know i, I suppose i'm going to keep on thinking about tax and and worrying i'm probably going to um leave kiev and head east um towards the battlefront um in the next couple of days um and there i i, I can't get this fairly unpleasant feeling out of my stomach um, that, you know, it, it's, it's going to start moving again and it's going to start getting, getting dreadful again. So I would just, um, you know, it's not a very, very original moving thought, but I would encourage our listeners just to, to, to keep an eye on things and, and, and not forget what's happening. Um, because we've still got a hell of a way to go yet in this ghastly bloody war. Well, thank you, Roland, so much for that. Uh, Stas Olenchenko. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for having us. Uh, I, I completely agree with Roland that like one of the important takeaways is that uh, we should all remember to to keep an eye on, on everything that is happening because this is not like the delivery of tanks is not a magic trick that would solve anything uh, like in in the long term uh, and and we should continue to solid solidarize to find new ways of uh, supporting Ukraine. And, and to basically, like, I think it is important right now to uh, agree on the strategy and on what uh, what is the potential, um, what, what is the end of this war that we are seeking, like, uh, from, from Ukraine's part. We, we know it from the first days that we want to free our lands. Uh, but from the point of view of our, our allies, I think it's important to to uh, as the war progresses uh, to understand what what is the final goal and and this is this is what's what's going to be crucial part of, of the entire discussion around the war. Thank you, Stas. Uh, and to to end, uh, Marichka Puchelakova. Yeah, I also wanted to say thank you for inviting us and for such interesting conversation and discussion. Even the discussion is really interesting topic actually to talk about later. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, in a few weeks we're going to be in Warsaw with a Ukrainian Spaces project. It's going to be like a live podcast. So if by any chance you're going to be there, we can meet and uh, discuss, uh, just talk uh, there. Uh, we're going to be for a few days uh, and you can find all the information on our uh, Twitter pages and also... Uh, uh, follow our Ukraine Explainers uh, Twitter account 
and also you can find their information about Instagram and our big uh, topics, um, long reads on Patreon, they're like open for everybody and you can read them, you can use them, uh, you can share them, uh, especially if you struggle to find some uh, words, uh, how to explain something about Ukraine, you can, you can share it without any problems or issues. Uh, but also, um, I don't know, I, I feel such kind of hope and strength, you know, uh, I think that we have this, we finally have this ability to, to, to law, to, to think in long perspective that we should plan our strategy, strategy. And, uh, you know, it's it, like the thing that I should, uh, I want to share is that after the, uh, the end of the war, it's, everything's not going to end. So it's going to be a lot of work, especially for us as Ukrainians in our society and now in our country and uh, you know uh, i just want to say to say thank you for all the support i know that you believe in ukraine and i know that you rediscover ukraine together with us thank you for this and thank you for all this attention and really 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 hope that we will meet in peaceful ukraine someday thank you ukraine the latest is an original podcast from the telegraph to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble.